Thanks for having me here this morning. I am, generally speaking, not the best at tech things, so I'm pretty sure I will mess this up as well. I do not even see, there's the cursor, perfect. I'm gonna leave it right there and not move my hand the entire time. So I am here today to talk to you about the open umbilical hernia repair. These are my disclosures. I take this bottom section from Julianne Sosa, who said that there's always additional disclosures, not just your financial ones required for the classic slide. And I think this is important. My background is, is that I am a giant fan of the MIS and the robotic approaches. So I had to giggle when I got the open repair. And what I think it took to do this talk was a lot of perspective and a lot of thinking about why I characterize the patient and how I tailor the repair. So hopefully none of these disclosures will limit what I'm able to present to you today um, and we'll get started. So I think what you heard very well in the talk that I am now following is that not all hernias are created evenly. You know, I think in terms of the open repair options, everyone in the room is probably familiar with the idea of a primary suture repair, familiar with the idea of mesh placement. And again, that gets into a lot of different categories. So the next two slides are basically gonna be the takeaway from the technique perspective, and then I'm gonna show you some of the data. So in terms of the primary repair, I think there are really two that are predominant out there. Again, everyone has their own ways of doing things, and I think that's why certain things like the shoulder ice repair for inguinal can't always be replicated in other locations because we don't know those tiny little finesse points that people do. But for primary repair, suture repair only, this is the Mayo repair located on the left. So that's a curvilinear incision that does not exceed 180 degrees. The idea is, is that you get aponeurotic reinforcement. So you're using the patient's tissue to reinforce their own tissue, thus doing what we call in the South a belt and suspenders type repair. The other option is a primary fascial closure again. Lots of debate on the primary fascial closure. I am a giant fan of the four to one suture to incisional length as in the stitch trial. Um, but again, many, many different ways depending on the size. You know, if you're dealing with a six millimeter primary umbilical hernia, it's pretty hard to compare those measurements because your knot takes up more than six millimeters of suture often to get that done. In terms of the mesh placements, I think there are a lot of things to discuss here with regards to either primary closure of the fascia versus not, and in addition to that, where do you put the mesh? Do you do an onlay above the primary closure? Do you do a sublay, either a retromuscular or preperitoneal positioning for that mesh? Or do you do an intraperitoneal mesh placement? You know, when I trained 15 years ago, um, at the beginning of residency, the IPOM approach of the intraperitoneal um, open repair was very common, and I think that has evolved since I've been in clinical practice, whether that will you know, continue where I am now or be an evolving, ever-moving door going forward, I think is what I believe it'll be, but we'll see, obviously, where we stand in another 15 years. So looking at outcomes, open umbilical hernias, primary hernias greater than one centimeter, I think the thing that everybody comes down to between the lap and the open approach comes down to surgical site infections and recurrence, right? Those are kind of the things that we all talk about. When we look at these two groups based on this study from the Danish hernia database, the readmission directly linked to hernia repair was about 6%. What you had was a trade-off with the open group having a higher risk for surgical site infections requiring operative debridement, the laparoscopic group having more severe intra-abdominal issues related to that. Looking at this meta-analysis, this tended towards a lower rate for wound complications in the laparoscopic. That makes sense. The longer the length of the incision, the increased amount of risk that you have there tended towards a lower recurrence in laparoscopic and a shorter surgery in open. So again, each of these has a different benefit in a different patient population. So again, tailoring the idea there. Looking at the obesity categories, this is a retrospective study from a prospectively collected database, uh, the AHSQC. They did not show a difference in surgical site infections or a difference in recurrence at three years in this database. Again, this is a potential for surgeon bias on selecting patients well at the front end, which is a good sign that we're doing some of this already in our surgical practice. 
Other things that we've spoken about, you know, the risk of recurrence is definitely dependent on the risk factors that the patients have present as well as the surgical techniques. So some of these things as the surgeon you cannot control, but your patient can control them in order to qualify for an operation. So postoperative infection had a recurrence rate as high as 33% in this study where patients with no risk factors only had a 1.4% recurrence risk. This is the one and only study that I saw focused on umbilical hernias about quality of life. So 585 patients. This did, however, contain recurrent umbilical hernias, which in my world puts them in a true incisional hernia category at that time. But that was the way the study was designed. So I'm going to go forward with how Dr. Henniford used that as I present it to you this morning. The groups initially were not matched. So they did propensity matching scores, showing a higher seroma rate in the laparoscopic approach. Um, and a higher infection rate also in the open approach. But this is the number of patients who had what they would qualify as a non-ideal quality of life. So looking at this, lower is better. It does tend to show that the open repair patients reported a better quality of life and decreased issues with activity limitation and pain. So definitely something that we need some more information on and to look at going forward in the future as we do more of these and try to, again, get a great algorithm. In terms of the European Hernia Society and America's Hernia Society coming up with guidelines for treatment, this is three years old now at this point in time. So again, everything is evolving. Um, and the Danish study came out after this by authors who are similar and participating in both of these. But one that I thought was important, is there a place for sutured repair in the elective setting? You know, yes, we know mesh decreases the risk of recurrence, but as was discussed earlier, maybe you don't burn some of those bridges as you're going forward. Um, what is the preferred mesh overlap? Again, one to four centimeters. That's a very broad range in all directions. Looking at that, again, strength of the recommendation, unfortunately weak. This would be the perfect one if there was a great answer, um, but preferred type of mesh, preferred layer, yes, I wish we had the perfect answer. I think this is a great paper. It does discuss in good depth the pros and cons of each of these, so if you haven't read this paper, I think this is one that will give you a lot of other good leads for looking into the advantages and disadvantages in a lot of these situations. It is definitely more of a summary type paper. So what I think is the most important to take away from this is to tailor your repair. There are many patients who do well with an open umbilical hernia repair. You know, those very, very small defects, I tend to limit that to less than one to two centimeters, typically less than one. And then in that setting, discussing with them pros and cons of that primary suture repair versus mesh placement with regards to what is the future going to look like? Are they going to have an additional X lap? Are they going to get pregnant and need their belly wall to stretch in a female who I would typically say, I prefer until you wait until after you've done all of your pregnancies, but if you can't, here are the options. So tailoring that repair and treating those hernias and those patients as individuals with the information that you have, I think is very, very important. Dr. Shada did a nice thing looking again at our practice patterns, and this supported the idea that people already are tailoring their practice patterns. And I think that was a very good thing to know that we're using a lot of this evidence and a lot of these studies to select surgeries for patients in a way that it's tailored and in a way that it is not just I do one and that's the single stamp of what I do. So with that said, it's very common. I do think we have to master this, but I don't think that we currently have a single best right answer. And I look forward to the discussion afterwards with everyone on this panel. <laughs>